the space age exploration of the Antarctic marine world continues. Calypso's helicopter is used to spot at high altitudes the wildlife that successfully thrives in this harsh environment. Of the few animals to prevail in the Antarctic, those in greatest number are the penguins. In Captain Cousteau's probe of the fertility of polar seas and its relationship to animal populations, the telephoto lens reveals penguin colonies, with penguins numbering in the hundreds of thousands. The penguins, like all Antarctic birds and mammals, are marine creatures. Along these sterile shores, the sea is their home and their only source of food. Sixty million years ago, the wings of these ancient birds evolved into flippers and the penguins adapted to swimming the life-sustaining seas. Now spending two-thirds of their time at sea, these most aquatic of birds, through frigid waves, freely fly. Off the Antarctic Peninsula, Calypso encounters porpoising penguins, the subject now for study by Captain Cousteau and his son Philippe in their further exploration of the mysterious Antarctic Ocean. This is part two of Jacques Cousteau's expedition in the Antarctic, the second of four reports from the Antarctic's icy seas with its towering landmarks of cathedral beauty here at the southern end of the world. Captain Cousteau's exploration of the Antarctic brings Calypso to the offshore islands of the Antarctic Peninsula, where penguins ride a weathered iceberg. Like the Antarctic marine life he has come to study, Cousteau's life is tied to the sea. He has long been curious about the ways of these highly specialized birds. The deep furrows in the ice reveal that these penguins have long used this berg as their private fishing dock. Now, as they travel to their breeding grounds, Calypso will follow them in their flight through the sea. Every Antarctic summer, when the ice breaks up, freeing the shoreline, Mature penguins return through rocky surf to the breeding grounds of their birth. Keen eyesight, strong swimming, 
the ability to pop straight up out of the water. It is their oneness with the sea that makes it possible to negotiate the jagged rocks. Out of their element on land, they may look awkward, but they manage pretty well. There is no segregation here. The chin straps, Adelie penguins, and the red beak gen twos live together in peaceful coexistence. Elephant seals snore on the shore as the penguin arrives and appears to check for the right address. The 3,000 pound elephant seals sometimes inadvertently bulldoze through shoreline nesting areas. To help avoid such disasters, most penguins nest above them on the hills. Late arrivals in the rookeries are pecked at. Males arrive earlier than females on their nests of stones they vocalize ecstatically to attract their mates. Penguins are basically monogamous. Most of them remain faithful to their mate from one breeding season to the next. Although couples seldom go to sea together, the returning female recognizes her mate by his voice. The reunions are no less enthusiastic than the rituals of newly courting couples. The songs of courtship are the exciting preludes to lullabies. A three or four year old unattached Adeli male, having returned to the rookery of his birth for the first time in an attempt to breed, must build an entirely new nest. Nearby, a mature gentoo rebuilds his old nest for his brooding mate. The more experienced nest-building males have learned shortcuts. They steal. Stone stealing is often audacious open thievery. The owner may complain, but persistency pays off. To his own mate, the raffles of the rookery is a good provider. A young Adélie male boldly approaches Philippe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When Philippe offers him stones, the Adélie is highly selective. After spending several years maturing at sea and with a short breeding summer partially gone, he must hustle to build his nest before all eligible females are claimed. his industry appears to be appreciated. The penguin study is led by Philippe and Albert Falco. They now observe the unattached male selecting the most important stone of his life to present to the female. If she accepts it, 
he has his spouse. Female penguins lay only two eggs a season, and breeding is often unsuccessful until the fifth or sixth year of their lives. Thus, in their average 12-year lifespan, a penguin couple produces about 12 fertilized eggs. If predation or pollution were to increase here, the penguin's future would not be secure. This chinstrap penguin is confused. He's proud of his stone, but can't find his mate. Penguins do not recognize each other by sight. For identification, they rely entirely upon the individual sounds of their voices. Finally, the chin strap locates his mate's call. In his haste to rejoin his mate, he has crossed his neighbor's nesting territory. Nests are jealously guarded against intrusion, and the chin strap is the most aggressive of all penguins. the rigors of a crowded life. Philippe and Albert Falco return once more to the exposed rocks of the penguin rookeries. After three weeks, the penguins should have laid their eggs. A female pushes her first precious egg under her breast to keep it as warm as possible for hatching. After both eggs have been laid, the males take over the first incubation shift. While the male penguins perform nest duty, the females will return to the sea for two weeks to feed and recuperate. For continuing observation, some of the penguins are lightly marked. The markings will wear off by summer's end. This beautiful Gen 2 will not for long be a scarlet lady. The marked Gen 2, accompanied by others of her species, picks her way through the rocks toward the sea. On the snow slope, Philippe and Falco follow the penguin's frolicsome journey. The females going to feed after just laying their eggs are joined by males who arrived earlier and who are now ready for their turn to feed. Although penguins have glands that remove salt from seawater, some prefer to eat snow to fill up on fresh water. The penguin's prime predator, the leopard seal, waits at the edge of the sea. Close to shore, the water is turbid, 
and the leopard seal has a chance to seize a penguin by surprise. Falco keeps the peace. There will be no hunting today. Once the penguins have made a safe entry, they maneuver too well to be easily caught. After long weeks of fasting, they are impatient to feed. Little is known about their life at sea. It is there that we have an appointment with them. Penguins rest for a moment like ducks after their long voyage from the rookeries. Then they resume their search for food. We follow the penguins at their cruising speed of about 10 miles per hour. The tiny 10-pound birds must be very efficient thermodynamic machines to cover such distances at such speed in frigid water. No wonder they need so much food. In slow motion, we can see how the penguin opens its mouth to take a quick breath of air without slowing down, like the great Olympic swimmer it is. As the penguins start their hunting, Calypso is stopped for filming. The men are amazed at the penguins' speed and agility. The penguins swim in bursts of speed exceeding 30 miles an hour. They are so maneuverable in open water, it is doubtful any enemy could catch them. As the penguins continue their hunt, Cousteau launches the diving teams. His multi-purpose mission in the Antarctic includes, in cooperation with NASA, the mapping of primary food resources and their use by creatures like the penguins. The men follow the penguins, now in search for concentrations of krill, their basic food. The penguins began to dive. The men will now attempt to film penguins feeding underwater. We are obliged to film them in slow motion to analyze how they swim, or rather, how they fly underwater. Only with their wings, their feet serve as rudders. Their camouflage is a perfect example of counter-shading. For a predator above, they are black on top to match the dark depth. And from below, breast of white to match the glittering surface. With eyes adapted for underwater vision, the penguins locate the shrimp-like food that whalers named krill. Our divers detour to photograph for the first time underwater an oncoming cloud of krill.
these small shrimp-like crustaceans have been the chief food of the largest of animals, the blue and fin whales, now virtually extinct. They also support seals, fish, and seabirds, as well as penguins. Projected as a possible protein source for man, krill may be on tomorrow's menu. Via satellite, Cousteau holds an international press conference. Dr. Cousteau, this is Marion Lewinstein from Time magazine. I believe I heard you tell the BBC correspondent that other biological forms were taking over the food left by the dead whales and the lack of whales in the Antarctica. What I was saying is that the uh, abundance of life in the Antarctic at the level of primary production of the uh, vegetable production is enormous. And uh, the first beneficiaries of this production, with only one intermediary, which was the krill, the mass of little shrimps, red shrimps, which abound in this area, were the whales. Now, these whales have been decimated. Uh, there is only 6% of them left today, about. So that a tremendous amount of unused food is now used by less interesting forms of life, like uh, starfish, for example. So that uh, because of the poor management of man with the whales, there is a continuous waste of uh, biological resources in the ocean today. Over. Now the penguins return from feeding to the shores below their rookeries. Fat again, and with their crops full of krill, they plot up the slopes to exchange places with their mates on the nests. For some penguins, there are happy returns. A female chinstrap mothers her newly hatched infant. Through regurgitation, she feeds it semi-digested krill. So satisfying. Falco's tour of the rookeries brings him to the Gen 2s. An older chick observes his mother's return. Now the male, stiff from sitting at home, will get his turn to feed as the female takes over nest duties. Falco locates the Gen 2 female he marked. Upon her return, she vocalizes to her mate, the ritual by which she identifies herself. The changing of the guard reveals that she and her mate have two healthy and hungry chicks. Penguins are born cold-blooded. Then make the phenomenal change to warm bloodedness with the help of the mother's 100 degree body temperature. Not all is blissful in the Gen 2 rookery. A female's second egg is not properly hatched on schedule, 24 hours after the first. The female tries to peck open the shell. The trapped infant is too weak to break out. The female worries over her chick. Then finally, stomps it free. It is a sad fact that the chick from the second egg is usually weaker 
and often does not survive. With its sharp eagle eyes, a skua on the wing seeks its prey below, the weak and the dead in the penguin nurseries. Penguins fear anything from the sky, and with the skua hovering above, the female tries to protect her babies. She gives her attention to the healthy one first and moves over it. Then with her beak, she tries to keep the sick one out of the sight of the circling skua. Penguins have no way of knowing that the skua, in fact, performs its service by reading their rookeries of infertile eggs and hopelessly doomed chicks. It is midsummer in the Antarctic when snow flurries hit the penguin rookeries. The downy chicks lack the water insulating oily feathers of their elders. They are vulnerable to the elements and many will sicken and die. A male adeli gathers stones in the mud to rebuild his disarrayed nest. The penguins try to reinforce their nests in a hopeless attempt to keep their young ones off flooded ground when the snow turns to rain. It is a difficult time as the penguins hurriedly carry stones finding their way through the agitated colony to their mates while trying to shelter the shivering chicks. In penguin rookeries, Antarctic storms take their toll. This is the skua's time. The penguins, with a strong sense of community, band together, shrieking warnings to keep the raider aloft. And Adeli defends his chick that had wandered into frigid water. Repeatedly, the skua is driven off. With his powerful flippers, the Adeli can deliver a disabling karate chop. Penguins have great courage. Even the dying baby tries to fight back. The Adeli will defend his cheek to the end. The Adeli checks for signs of life. The baby is still breathing. And now, to build a protective wall around his chick, the valiant Adeli looks for stones.
Now the thwarted skua concentrates on another chick that had wandered off and died. Cautiously, he prepares to carry it off. He is forced to relinquish it as the Adeli, with its angry eyes gleaming and its neck plumage at half cock, drives him from his prize. The skua is persistent, but his persistence is more than matched by the penguin's determination to deprive the intruder of the fallen chick. The raider of the rookery is at last obliged to retreat. The victorious Adeli has much to crow about. The frustrated skua dive bombs Philippe, who comes with raw meat. For skuas, too, have their chicks to feed. The eagle of the Antarctic is a sea bird that comes to these sterile shores only to reproduce. Philippe's offerings are eagerly accepted. Nesting in pairs, not organized like penguins, skua couples and their offspring live on the fringes of existence. Of two skua hatchlings, only one clown-footed chick usually survives. With the passing of the storm, Falco investigates the rookeries. For penguin parents with growing chicks to feed, more frequent trips to the sea are necessary. They must provide continuing sustenance for the insatiable youngsters. After feeding, it's time to snuggle against mother's breast and doze. The nurseries are now warmed by the sun. One parent at sea, the other stands guard over its sleeping infants. Flippers embracing, beside their mother, two-week-old twin babies sleep secure. They will be on their own in only six weeks more. In the penguin rookeries, the plump chicks have begun to molt. Their fuzzy down is being replaced by thick, oily feathers. Now nearly the size of their parents, some are forced to move about to develop their muscles. One youngster flaps his wings, but he'll never take off. He pecks at mother, asking for food. At this stage, most young penguins are sluggish and just stand around and molt. A too independent chick is chastised for wandering away. The preoccupation of the fledglings is food. A four pound chick could eat its weight in 15 minutes, given the chance. The chicks are now fed reluctantly. This parent, slenderized by the steady demands for regurgitated food, has started the weaning process by reducing the feeding of its persistent chicks. A 
Observing the penguin weaning, Philippe discovers the marked female Jantou. Penguin pounds feed only their own, which they recognize by their voices. The marked Gentoo has only one remaining cheek, so feeding is not a problem. When not one, but two chicks survive, competition between the twins becomes keen. The unfed chick gets mad at mother, hopping mad. For unruly chicks, the penguins have an educational system that employs old-fashioned discipline. When a chick throws a temper tantrum, other adults join in putting him in his place. The ravenous chick runs after his mother through the rockery, screaming for food. The winning chase is on. The frustrated fledgling in pursuit of his mother now is joined by the other chick. With winter coming, the mother will lead them to the sea and teach them to swim and fish for themselves. There will be no more free meals. Ice-strewn seas and the leaden skies are harbingers of harsher days. Storm petrels, named for their ability to walk on water, as St. Peter is recorded to have done, feed on krill. They eat their fill before moving on to warmer seas. As temperatures drop, Adult penguins leave the rookeries to migrate back to sea in mixed groups of males and females. The now independent chicks are left behind. The penguins slip and slide down rocky hillsides, which are soon to be entombed by ice and snow. As the adult penguins approach the water, they are swept with excitement. The arduous task of producing a new generation has been completed. For eight months, they will revel in the seas before returning to these shores to breed again. Now, Captain Cousteau, accompanied by Albert Falco, comes to visit the penguin juveniles left behind. Soon winter will reach out from the continental ice shelves and freeze the seas solid for miles around. A few adult gentoos still dot the shore, but Cousteau will go inland, where the fledglings have temporarily taken over the abandoned rookeries. Cousteau approaches slowly, but the youngsters run away. The birds
shepherds may be frightened by his height. So Cousteau decides to sit down among them, hoping that with the penguins' natural curiosity, they will come closer. Instead, the immature birds, some with down still on their heads and necks, retreat further. Cousteau has come to record their voices, but receives the silent treatment. Suspecting that penguins can discern colors, I wonder if it is my red parka that is frightening the youngsters. So I decide to change to Dorado's green jacket to see if it will disturb the penguins less. With my recorder ready, I try to avoid moving. It is still a standoff. Then suddenly, a sign of interest. Apparently, a neutral color does not inhibit them. If these penguins have a pecking order, I am most surely at the bottom of it. It is time to leave. In spite of these moments of rapport, I am but too aware of being a stranger in this world of penguins. The seas are now freezing off the Antarctic Peninsula as a launch moving south escorts Calypso through offshore ice belts. In the snow-obscured distance, penguins on an ice floe are viewed by Falco. They are Adelie juveniles, now graduates to Antarctic seas. They wear their black gowns proudly. Their mohawk haircuts, lone remnants of babyhood, are their mortarboards, as this class of 73 confidently sets forth in the world. They will not return to land for three or four years. On ice floes, pushed by winds and currents, they will tour the Antarctic seas. Then they will come back to their natal rookeries for breeding as the cycle continues. Now, past the youthful travelers, Calypso moves south, down the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula.
In open water, we come upon adult penguins enjoying their freedom. In the 19th century, millions of these endearing flyers of the sea were slaughtered for their oil by sealers. Today they are protected and multiply, but their livers are already infected by toxic chemicals as deep sea currents carry waste from heavily populated continents to the penguins' feeding grounds in these remote Antarctic seas. As the world's waters mix, there is but one ocean. Not until we understand this unity can we safeguard the pathways of future penguins in flight. Aboard Calypso, Captain Cousteau continues his long and often hazardous journey to the southern end of the world. On the way, strong currents push pack ice toward Calypso, threatening to trap her. Via satellite, Cousteau contacts NASA for weather and ice predictions. From Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt, Maryland, Cousteau receives the latest sea ice data. The compact ice east of 85 degrees west has broken and is drifting to the north in the path of Calypso. In launches, men push fragmented ice away from Calypso's bow. The ice blocks have razor-sharp hidden tongues that can rip an unprotected hull. Captain Cousteau and Calypso divers will attempt to discover what lies beneath the Antarctic solid ice fields in part three of Cousteau's expedition in the Antarctic, Beneath the Frozen World.